Um, this chart again, I think you can argue that cameras are getting lighter and lower in power in time. You can compare Cassini uh, to New Horizons. Even if you added this sort of filter wheel to, to New Horizons, it wouldn't come close to Cassini. Likewise, Mach versus LROC. So that's a good thing. Um, here's just a little bit of a size comparison, a, a attempted size comparison. The perspective is different, but this is high rise at Ball Aerospace. These are the two LROC narrow angle cameras. There's actually two of them flown. This is at Malin Space Science Systems in La Jolla nearby here. Uh, most, of, most of LROC shown here is actually Baffle, pretty small camera. So high rise looks big here. Um, the high rise telescope is the largest telescope center on the planet. It has a half a meter primary mirror, which just for perspective, that's smaller than the tertiary mirror of JWST. Uh, but you guys don't get to send your big telescopes to other planets. So. Uh, and high rise is actually substantially uh, lightweighted compared to its predecessor, which is the QuickBird uh, terrestrial remote sensing uh, camera on the Digital Globe spacecraft. So here's a, a photograph, roughly the scale of, of QuickBird and of high rise. So, uh, substantial amount of light weighting went into high rise to make that possible. So I want to show you some pictures now and talk a little bit about some of the, the science that's being done and, and some of the challenges in different parts of the solar system. So for Cassini ISS, one of the uh, most interesting discoveries is that of these erupting jets coming out of the south polar region of Enceladus. Um, Whenever we sell these missions up front, we have these broad goals, like discover the origin of this and that. And uh, you know, usually we don't really fully understand the origin of something. So we get to recycle these, these goals. You know. But for Cassini, one of them was, what's the origin of the E-ring? And we, we actually figured that one out. We can check that one off. Um, <clears throat> so here's uh, one of these images at nine meters per pixel that's unsmeared. We also earlier got this image here at four meters per pixel that is smeared by, by several pixels. And we knew that would, would happen, but uh, thought it was worthwhile anyhow. Uh, these are both images of near the source region of these vents. Naturally, we want to get a closer look at that. And uh, so this just illustrates the, the limitations of a f these framing cameras are designed mostly for imaging distant objects. And we just have to do the best we can during the brief period of time that we're flying by very close to uh, a satellite. Um, and uh, this was our first look, this one actually, even though smeared, our first look at the blocky structure of this uh, vent region. Uh, not a great landing site, by the way. So for high rise, uh, we've had fun, and for LROC as well, uh, finding all of our own uh, debris left behind on uh, Mars and the Moon. Uh, this is just a family portrait of back shells and parachutes from past landers on Mars, prior to Phoenix, that is. So Mars Pathfinder, Spirit and Opportunity, which landed only a few years, four years or so prior to high rise, taking these pictures. Uh, Viking 1, and we were surprised to actually still see the parachute of, of Viking 1 uh, 30 years later. Uh, I should have thrown in the picture of Phoenix before and after, because after only one year, the, the parachute of Phoenix has completely disappeared. Uh, here's a picture of the Opportunity rover. This is one of our first... Uh, full resolution images of, of Mars, which fortuitously, we, we got our first images right after Opportunity actually arrived on the rim of Victoria Crater. So that was exciting. And this little line there, that's actually the shadow of the uh, PanCam mask, which is quite narrow, but you can detect narrow features that are below your resolution limits when they're uh, linear. Another very popular uh, image was of the uh, Phoenix actually descending uh, on its parachute. So here it is in the air about 20 kilometers above the surface. It's right there. It looks like it's landing right in this crater, but it's actually well in front of the crater and it's the perspective. Um, 
So there's the Phoenix lander, the parachute. You actually see the cords from it. And we also, there's a little dot there, and from the timing of this, that's actually the heat shield that had just been ejected uh, uh, seconds before the picture was taken. Uh, this is the Phoenix lander on the surface now with uh, the two uh, solar arrays open on either side. They're circular fans. We've re-imaged this recently, and it looks like those arrays have largely uh, collapsed uh, from the seasonal CO2 frost over the winter. Just an example of something that we see with, at this scale that we couldn't see previously, columnar jointing. Uh, this is in what we believe are lava flows exposed in the, uh, the rim of an impact crater. Uh, the impact crater uh, tilts up the layers so that what, what is initially vertical jointing is tilted up so that we can see it from, from orbit. Uh, we've been finding new impact craters on Mars and also the Moon, as I'll talk about. Uh, the way to find these is primarily with MRO's context camera. Uh, that's a six meter per pixel uh, camera, but that would be called a high resolution camera on any other mission. This one is called a context camera. But it, given the data rate and the, the 30 kilometer swath width, it, uh, uh, it gets considerable coverage and repeat coverage. So here's an example of two context images showing this new collection of dark spots and we've come to recognize what this is. It's from bolides that break up in a thin Martian atmosphere. Uh, the atmosphere is about six millibars on Mars. On Earth, these smaller rocks explode in the upper atmosphere, and we don't, they don't make craters at all. Uh, on, on Mars, the atmosphere is thin enough to, to break up many of these and make these clusters. But then, so once CTX discovers something like this, we follow up with high rise. And in this case, we saw something very interesting, which were these bright blue spots on the floors of two of these craters. And we followed up, and we suspected it was water ice. And we followed that up and watched it fade over time, as it should uh, if it was water ice, given the, the time of year. It's done that uh, from, from the brightness of these spots and also from the rate of its, of its fading of time. Uh, we've been able to deduce that this is remarkably clean water ice. It's 99.9% it's .9 ice with very little dust in it, which was a surprise. And we found, this, we found these craters now exposing ice in a number of places. This is now in the mid-latitude, down to 43 uh, south, uh, 43 north. We've seen these only in the north, but down to 43. Phoenix landed at about 68. And Phoenix found shallow ice. It, it landed at that latitude for the sake of having shallow ice that it could dig down to. Uh, it turns out it didn't need to go to such a high latitude. And in fact, uh, we're finding this ice in the, the initial set of these we found are all in this region of Mars. It's right next to Viking Lander 2. And w with these observations, uh, recalibrating uh, where we expect the ice to be, the ice table to be. Uh, we think that Viking Lander 2, the clean ice, is predicted to be about 15 centimeters deeper than it actually did. It only needed to dig a little bit deeper. And 30 years ago, they would have discovered this, this clean ice, or at least ice, uh, from, from the Viking Lander 2. But nobody had any idea it was there. Um, uh, we're finding uh, new impact craters with ice now scattered around uh, elsewhere in the high northern latitudes of Mars.